Guys, I want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru, the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com. If you have any interest in buying optics or have any glassing questions, whether it be tripods, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, range finders, anything to do with glassing, give Cody a call 702-847-8747. That's extension 2 or you can email him at optics at gohunt.com. You can also send him a text or call him on his cell phone at 602-399-3699. Guys, right now at GoHunt.com Insider, you can take advantage of the free trial. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott. You're going to be able to take advantage of a free trial of the Insider. GoHunt is always adding more value for their Insider members. They've now added real 3D maps as a part of Insider for no additional cost. What an incredible value. Very soon, they're going to have their mobile app up as well. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott and sign up for a free trial. If you're already an Insider member, it's automatically part of your Insider membership. And you can just go to the Maps tab up at the top once you sign in as an Insider. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. To find out more, you can go to KUIU.com, Kuyu.com. They're a direct-to-consumer company. They sell everything off of the Kuyu.com website. I also do a lot of question and answer on my Instagram where I'm answering questions about guys wanting to know about gear about Kuyu, so tune into my Instagram. I want to thank Kuyu for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. And I want to thank AllElk.com, home of the Bugle Mule. Use the JSO10 to save 10% on all orders. The Bugle Mule attaches to your bugle, and it's a great little carrier that holds three elk calls right there on your bugle tube. And it's I can't wait to use it this season. Again, thanks to all the sponsors of my podcast. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got my friend Cole Olam on the line. Cole, how you doing? Doing good, Jay. How yourself? Good. I'm anxious to talk to you. Uh, we had a fun night fishing the other night and uh, got to l- talk a lot about Colorado hunting and I thought it would be great to get you on the podcast, someone that's just right in the middle of the Colorado hunting scene uh, from every aspect and almost every animal, someone that's born and raised in Colorado uh, also a part owner in a guide service, Tenderfoot Outfitters, out based out of Gunnison, Unit 54. Uh, but, you know, you live up in the Newcastle area, New, or excuse me, Silt area, raised kind of in the Newcastle area, I believe. Um, yes, sir. And you just had a, just a wealth of knowledge floating down the river, so I wanted to get you on a podcast because I know I have a lot of listeners that are, um, they love hunting Colorado, whether it be over-the-counter Uh, elk or putting in for deer or sheep or moose or any of this stuff so um, looking forward to having you on the podcast appreciate it jay um cole let's start out with a little introduction on yourself uh where you were raised born and raised kind of where you grew up hunting who you grew up hunting with and such okay so i was actually born in uh some people might know it's a little town called meeker colorado um one of the last babies actually born there um, grew up, you know, spent the, probably the first 14 years of my life there. My dad was an outfitter there, also was a Orvis Indoors fishing guide. So, I mean, it, it's been in my blood since the beginning and pretty much been running all over the wet, northwest part of the state, um, fly fishing, hunting, and was about freshman high school. We moved over to the Roaring Fork Valley and went to high school in Glenwood and uh, started outfitting when I was 18 19 years old and you know pretty been pretty fortunate to either for myself or friends or outfitting or guiding been dang near about in every unit in the western half of the state and uh just what i love to do and it's my passion so. that's awesome cole another thing um that i learned about you is um you have a very successful electrical contracting business uh here in the roaring fork valley talk a little bit about 
um, kind of your transition into the electrical contracting business and uh, what you do on a day to day basis uh, with that business? Yeah, um, that's kind of funny. I actually started out as a, a power lineman, um, and then I realized, you know, to you know, kind of go into business for myself, it'd have to be through the uh, um, electrical industry. So I, I switched gears when I was about mm, 22, 21, and I went through my apprenticeship. I went and got my journeyman's license after my four years, and then eventually my master's. And here within the last year, I've gone out on my own and. Um, it's been good. I do a lot of high-end residential, big custom homes in Aspen, Basalt area, and then also commercial work. Um, got quite a few commercial jobs going on, but it's kind of allowed me to be my own boss and have some freedom come fall. And with that um, successful electrical contracting business, uh, you also are a co-owner, I believe, uh, in Tenderfoot Outfitters, which is uh, based over in the Gunnison Basin in, in Unit 54. Um, talk a little bit about that business as well. Yeah, um, so when I was 19, I, I wanted to start guiding. And, um, Fred Stinson and Kendall Butts out of Tenderfoot was basically the first one to give me a shot as a 19-year-old kid and um, trusted, my, trusted me with their clients at that young age. And um, basically kind of grew into that business and got to be really close to those guys. And, um, here a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to become a partner in that. Um, primarily Fred and Kendall are kind of the day to day guys. And I've kind of moved back into a, um, would you say booking aspect and, um, you know, kind of getting the word out. And I mean, you'll see my face a few weeks a year down there. Um, especially if we get like a primo tag, where we get a sheep hunter, moose hunter. I really enjoy the, um, late season mule deer hunts. But. Unit 54 is an interesting unit, obviously being in the Gunnison Basin, and we're going to talk about a slew of units here. So for the listeners out there, we're going to kind of bounce around. But, you know, 54 coal has, I mean, you know, historically been a phenomenal unit. It's in the Gunnison Basin. You know, it's it's had its ups and downs. It's, it's seen a lot of different uh, t- tides, if you will, turn up and down. Um, and one was, I believe, the 07 uh, winter kill of deer. I believe they had a big winter kill. Um, talk a little bit about 54, uh, you know, where it's at now, how, how, how the quality of, of hunting is in 54. Uh, you're right, definitely. That winter of 07, 08 really, really hurt those deer bad. Um, we went from probably the, I mean, it was arguably top unit in the state. And I mean, it, it hurt. I mean, 2010, 11 into 12 was just, I mean, it was hard to even find a buck, let alone a mature buck. And I would say, oh, 2016, things started looking up as far as deer. Um, we had a pretty tough winter that uh, I would say the winter of 17 going into 2018, we, it killed some deer for sure. We went, I believe we went 50 percent tag reduction 54 and i think our neighboring unit 55 seen almost 70 percent tag reduction there um but i, I mean things are kind of looking up but I, it, I don't think you'll ever see any of those gunnison basins be what they were from about 01 to 07 but i mean just, the deer just there, from a tag the, step standpoint uh, they still haven't gotten down to the low numbers that they were in those years is that what you mean no prior to the they, kill no they sure haven't and you know, I mean, the genetics are always going to be there. There's always a chance, but it's definitely, I think too many people have that image of their head of the Gunnison Basin from, you know, the early to mid 2000s. And it, I just don't think with the way we're being managed that we'll ever see that again. Um, so it's kind of one of those take it while the getting's good. Right. Um, uh, but What uh, about the elk hunting in 54? Uh, um, The elk hunting is pretty solid. I mean, we, I mean, you know, we're pretty consistently we're harvesting bulls in that, you know, low to mid 300 class. And, you know, a pretty good opportunity in that, you know, five plus five point bulls are better. But um, we definitely pull bulls off the mountain in that 300 to 330 class yearly. Um, so it's definitely got some deep, good quality um, because they've kind of managed 54 a little differently. 
Um, they've kind of moved it into a over the counter with a cap system. So it's not a free for all unlimited over the counter tag. So you're going to see your archery, your muzzle loader, your first rifle, your fourth rifle is draw tags. And then second, third being over the counter with a cap. So there'll be only a, a limited number of over the counter opportunities there, much like Idaho. Interesting. Uh, with Tenderfoot Outfitters, you guys also do moose and sheep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so just not that last year was the first year um, that 54 was offered a moose tag. And our, I mean, just in the last, I would say three to four years, there's just the moose population has blown up on us. And we had some just giant bulls showing up um, last year. Um, we had the moose hunter who drew the tag and um, kind of a long story short, he ended up harvesting the wrong bull. But I mean, there's multiple bulls in there right now that are over that 40 inch mark. And then this year, um, my partner, Fred actually has the tag. Oh, cool. So, and then the, so they gave two tags this year and then another local from Gunnison has a tag. So, um, and they're getting there. I mean, they went from one tag to two tags, so we'll see kind of what they're thinking for 2021. But um, the moose population is really blowing up, and it's it's a different moose hunt because where these moose are living is roughly that's about seven miles in on horseback. So it's a rather difficult hunt for somebody who doesn't have horses or the ability to get in there. And that kind of portrays for us on the outfitting side is is we're the ones that have the permit in there and the ability to get in there. Gotcha. And then the sheep unit, um, what, what's the unit for sheep that you guys... Oh, so that'll be S54. It's this, basically the same as the elk unit. It's one of the few units in the state that kind of keep it squared up like that. But Yeah, it's, it's always been interesting how they did goat and sheep different than the deer and the elk. Um, you know, in Arizona, they kind of keep it simple and it's, you know, it's just the unit and then, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just funny how they do that. But, uh, what kind of sheep quality do you guys have there in S54? Oh, we've actually got some pretty good rams. Um, we, it's not uncommon to see rams pushing that 180 mark, um, pretty consistently. You're, you're going to get some, some full curl rams in that, I would say low seventies pushing that low 80 mark. Um, but you know, typically the standard you know, we're talking seven plus year old Rams and that, um, you know, pretty much I would say our average Ram is low seventies right now. Okay. Um, but definitely there's some big Rams. The sheep are kind of scattered per se. Like we've got a lot of pretty solid population in the, in the high basins. And then there's also a group of sheep that kind of hang out low, um, basically right above blue Mesa. They're pretty well known sheep. They're in the, the Dillon, Dillon pinnacle sheep that you can basically view right off I, I mean highway 50 and there's okay. there's been a really big couple of rams that live down there in that low pinnacle country too interesting so at tenderfoot you guys are primarily doing horseback wilderness style hunts right yep that is our bread and butter and you know the full you've got the camp cook in there you've got the wall outfitter tents wall tents and all of that set up yep um yeah, we've got, we call it the Ramada of the Rockies. So we've got a, I believe right now it's a 30, we got a 38 foot cook tent, um, you know, in-house cook. And then typically we're running four to five guest tents, all brand new um, Montana canvas um, guest tents. And then we have a 28 foot guide tent and tack tent. And I mean, we pretty much, it's a little tent city up there, but yeah, all top of the line tents, um, top of the line stoves, pretty much, you know, well, pretty much top of the line, what you can get. I mean, it's comfort. And guys, uh, I'll link it up in the show notes, but uh, they've got a website, tenderfoot-outfitters.com, and uh, you can find out more about that um, business and the hunts that they offer there. I want to go back, Cole, to growing up in Meeker, Colorado, because Meeker is a very interesting place. When you pull into Meeker, I mean – it has a real Western feel. It has, you know, it's, it's not one of these towns that's been super commercialized like a lot of towns in Colorado. Um, your dad being an Orvis endorsed, uh, fly fishing guide, uh, as well as I believe outfitter in that area. What was it like having your dad, uh, you know, be a well-known fishing guide in that area? 
Oh, uh, I mean, as a kid, you know, I didn't know anything different. I pretty much thought every kid grew up, you know, going fly fishing after school every day. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a heck of a way to grow up. I mean, I got to fish some primo private water every day and, um, you know, it was just cool, you know, cause that's what dad did. And, you know, he was very good about involving me and my brother in it. I mean, it wasn't common that he'd, you know, had a trip in the morning and he'd be at the Meeker Elementary picking us up from school and we'd be driving up river to fish every day. And I mean, it's just how I grew up. I mean, I, I didn't know anything different. Was your dad as much into fishing or hunting as he was into fishing as you were growing up or would you say? Oh, yeah. So he yeah, was every I mean, bit involved in hunting. Yeah. I mean, it was just fishing what, what got you through till hunting season. But <laughs> I mean, I don't even think I knew who my dad was from about September till November. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think mom had to wear a lot of hats in the fall because dad was gone. Dad was gone. That's awesome. And uh, your dad now is... Uh, enjoying a little bit of retired life and they'll spend some time in Belize, does a lot of saltwater fly fishing and, and yeah, is, is living yeah, a good he, life like he should. Do. Yeah. Yeah. He just retired him and him and mom are actually, they're heading to Billings, Montana here next week to pick up their new camper. So they're just going to go good for them. I guess drive around the country and live in their camper. Good for them. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, then the transition from Meeker to going, uh, going to high school in Glenwood, um, you know, how did that play a role at all in any of, you know, expanding some of your hunting horizons and looking at some different units? Um, you oh, know, yeah. at I mean, what it, point it kinda, is that kind of when you kind of branched out and started hitting some of this different stuff? Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I think it was a, a driver's license that kind of opened that up to me. <laughs> um, you know, cause dad, we were really, you know, what we had in Meeker was what dad ran. And then, you know, we moved to Glenwood and we were kind of out of our element per se and you know i you know once i got to high school i was you know glenwood springs high school our backyard is the roaring fork river so i mean i used to take my fly rod to school and i fished every day and then you know then the the big challenge then when i i started hunting on my own was i wanted to learn the maroon bells and then you know i was running the bells and then i wanted to learn the west elks and then the raggeds and and uh I, when i was younger it was um, Cameron Haynes was kind of the one that was really pushing that, that backcountry bow hunting model per se. And it was all about, you know, as high as you could get and as deep and nasty as you could get. And that's kind of what we were striving for at that time. How, and, uh, how have you seen, how have you, well, let me back up. Have you seen, have you seen that change at all um, with say the younger generation or, you know, with that, you know, one thing Cam has done is just he's inspired so many people out there. It sounds like including yourself as far as just wanting to get out there and experience and get, you know, put a backpack on and get away. Um, do you think that's changed? Do you think it's still very prevalent or? or uh, I mean, it is. I think I think there's a lot of new people in the industry now. I think, I mean, we're talking back in 2004, 2005 when Cam was kind of in his heyday and you know, he was with Eastman's and I mean, that's kind of was our, our gospel at the time, but I mean, come, you know, there's a lot of other guys right now. I mean, I think once I got, I actually met, um, Nate Simmons and David Long when I was a 16 year old kid packing in for a deer hunt. And at the time I, you know, I barely even knew who they were. And then I got to know Nate pretty well and David and, and there for a while, I talked to David a lot on the phone and, um, you know, I learned from those guys and, you know, I kind of started seeing those guys as really the DIY, you know, public land guys. And, and I mean, nothing against Cam, I'd do the same, but Cam's kind of moved more into, you know, hunting the real primo private ranch. I, I don't know when was the last time Cam Haynes threw a backpack on and hunted public land, but, um, he definitely lit the fire in a lot of us, you know, 10, 15 years ago for sure. Yeah, for sure. Inspired a lot of people. Um, so bouncing around, you've got your driver's license and you're just hitting all the different mountain ranges. You're hiking your butt off and just learning country and learning places to go. Um, you know, that, that turned into, you know, really learning all the units in basically the Western half of Colorado, right? Whether it be scouting, hunting, you know, going with buddies, going to family, you know, guiding all of that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, that was it's pretty much in the summers, you know, and but you know, summers between school. I mean, that's what I did. Is I just I had a tent in the back of the truck and a sleeping bag and you know a few mountain houses, and it was got off work on a Friday, and I, you know, I was taken off, and I mean, I just I just was really hungry to you know figure it out and learn it, and um, I wanted to see country that you know dad never had never shown me and other people hadn't shown me it was kind of just throwing a throwing a dart at the map every weekend was kind of how i was at that age i caught you today coming back uh, from scouting you've got a handful of great tags in your inner circle and your family and friends um you were down doing some scouting uh give us a little bit of a on the ground you know boots on the ground report for colorado what it's looking like i know you were collecting some trail cams and stuff uh, you have to have a pretty good sense of, of what it looks like out there on the terrain. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, as you know, Jay, it's been brutal hot. I mean, we're, we've had just weeks upon weeks of 90 degree temperature and I mean, we're getting some rain and, you know, a little moisture here and there, but I mean, I was out kind of South of Jun- junction today and I mean, it's, it's dry and we've got a really big fire right now to the North of grand junction and the debec area and it i mean it's hazy and smoky and i mean hopefully we get some rain to kind of help the the firefighters out on that but it definitely the spring we were looking pretty promising and and things were green and you know water looked good but i mean it's definitely we're kind of moving on that drought side um but you know antler quality side wise i mean the deer are looking pretty good i mean the I haven't seen it really affect them. Bulls are looking pretty good. I think if anything, our bulls probably started strong and we're going to see some, you know, bulls that are strong up front. And then usually what I've seen in Western Colorado on a, on the tail end of the growing season when it gets hot is they get, you know, a little weak on their G5s and their main beams. But I, I think we should be all right. Right on. Um, all right. Let's talk about, uh, Let's talk about deer a little bit. Um, you've kind of had your hand in some big deer, uh, some raffle hunters and some different, I believe, auction hunters and stuff. You've, uh, whether you've given advice or been out in the field taking guys, all of that. Um, what is the status of Colorado deer as far as a trend, um, you know, in general? Yeah, I mean, I think me and a lot of other people are kind of, we're, we're honestly concerned right now i mean i think we're trending down I mean, we're seeing less and less mature age class deer i think you know and, and everyone's trying to come up with the answers is it too many predators are we over hunting or and i think it's a magnitude of things i think colorado deer are in a very high demand and we're i definitely think we're over harvesting per se on top of that i think the influx of people in the state and ho- building homes on winter range is affecting them but, I mean, all things considered, I think where we were 10 years ago to where we are now is ultimately, I think we're on the decline. I think, you know, big deer are becoming less and less common. I mean, they're still there. We're still killing them. But it's definitely, you know, it's not what it was for sure. And I, I'm worried that these late, late season dates that are coming at us are really going to kind of clean off the the last bit of mature deer we've got left if the weather lines up for these hunts. Right. I mean, with having those um, third and fourth seasons as late as they are over the next couple of years, certainly the big deer, the mature deer in the crosshairs, so to speak. Um, oh, for sure. I mean, they're just going to be sitting ducks out in the open in the, you know, on the winter grounds. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, totally. I mean, I mean these these season dates, especially when you start looking at 2021 four season hunts. I mean, we're talking governor's tag dates. I mean, we're we're hunting multi. I mean, we're hunting bucks and you know Thanksgiving, and I mean that's usually when we're talking about governor's tags. And then you know governor's tags, we're killing you know four bucks in the entire state at perhaps that date. Where I mean, we're going to be killing you know a couple thousand. Yeah. bucks at that date and i think we're gonna be you know it's gonna hurt us more than it's gonna help us i mean if you i mean you can't tell me that you know hunting that late with deer that vulnerable are gonna be it's gonna be good for any of us let's talk a little bit about let's shift gears here we'll talk a little bit about deer um colorado 
you know, for years has been known for their elk hunting, uh, for years have been known for their over the counter hunting where guys could just come buy a tag and come hunting. And, uh, I know that Colorado has done some changes on the OTC archery elk. I know they're talking about doing some more changes. Um, just curious on your opinion of specifically OTC archery elk, um, how do you think that experience is as of late com- maybe compared to the way it used to be? Uh, I think it's definitely something that's blown up. Um, I definitely from a popularity the, standpoint. You mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, bow hunting has became extremely popular and I mean, I grew up cutting my teeth on those over the counter archery hunts. And, um, I think what I'm seeing now, and honestly, I've, I've quit doing it. I mean, I've just gotten frustrated with it. I just hunt, if I hunt archery, it's on a limited entry tag, but I mean, honestly, there's probably more people in the woods during the over the counter archery hunt right now than there is in over the counter rifle hunts. And what it's resulted in is these elk of, I mean, they're getting extremely call shy and they get hunted heavily, you know, starting in September, late August, I believe this year we start the second of September. Um, and it's, it's really had to change your tactics to be consistently successful at this because the days of, you know, coming in, having bulls lighten up and talking pretty routinely at about mid month is, I mean, it's tough. I mean, even, I mean, I'm guiding guys and, you know, I'm eight, 10 miles deep in the wilderness right now. And it's, I'm seeing the effects of the added pressure of, of that over the counter archery hunt. How much does, I mean, you've been on horseback and stuff your whole life and packing and and doing all of that stuff. Uh, So you're saying that because of the popularity of the sport, which is a great thing. Well, I think everybody would agree, but with that comes some hurdles that we all have to face. And the fact is you're saying, you know, you're eight to 10 miles in on horseback and you're, you're seeing more and more pressure. Um, do you think at some point the Colorado division wildlife is going to, you know, take some of that public feedback? Cause there's some that don't want anything to change. And I get that. And there's some that do, um, do you think Colorado division wildlife is going to actually make the, all these OTC hunts into some sort of draw? I mean, it's possible. I mean, I, I think that that over the counter archery hunt is such a cash cow for them right now. They probably won't. Um, but you know, in my standpoint, I would rather see it become a over the counter with a cap or just like a kind of like what we've done with the flat tops is we've turned the flat tops into a draw but it, it's not hard to draw or I mean, 54, like my, you know, where I outfit out of, we're at a draw now where we were over the counter a matter of, you know, a handful of years ago. And I think it's improved things um, because when you've get that added pressure and I mean, you, you know, you start looking at these, these great rut hunts, you get to go on in Arizona, you know, it's limited pressure. Those bulls are more vocal where when you've got a couple hundred thousand guys, whatever it be in there, you know, pressing those elk, calling at them and, you know, it's, it's going to affect the rut and, and those elk just have learned they don't talk. It's almost like elk that are in wolf country they and just get um, more silent and they just, yeah, they're they just getting real the trees, silent. They're not out in the open as much and they're kind of just, no, they're getting low. Yeah. They were, let's say 10, 10, 15 years ago when I first started, it was, I mean, it wasn't uncommon just to go out and chase bulls bugling all day long. And, and they were great hunts. You know, that was why we hunted archery because the woods were quieter. Um, we had vocal elk consistently and it was just really enjoyable hunting. And now it's, you know, every trailhead's got six vehicles, 10 vehicles at it. And, you know, you, they're just, people are just going out and hammering on calls all day and, yeah. you know, bugling at bulls when they shouldn't be. And I, I tell a lot of people, the best thing you can do on an over the counter archery hunt is put that call in your pocket and that's your last ditch resort to kill because right. you're going to be more successful treating it like a high country mule deer hunt and just, you know, finding them and getting in tight. And maybe when you're in tight, make a noise. But I mean, the days of calling bulls across the Canyon from, you know, 500 yards away is just, it's slim now. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have it happen every year, but not as consistently. When you talk about OTC and, and, you know, we're talking, let's, let's open it up to archery and the rifle hunts, you know, some of the third, yeah. third seasons, four seasons, whatever. Well, I don't think for, there's some over the counter four season, but, um, 
maybe there's not. I need to fact check that. But just in general, OTC, you've got units spread around. You've got units that are close to metropolitan areas. You've got some units that are, you know, way out in the middle, quote unquote, middle of nowhere. I've heard and seen and found that sometimes uh, people might overthink it and try and go to some of those units that are, you know, out way out away. And it actually relieves some pressure from some of these areas that are closer to town. Is that a complete fallacy in your mind or do you oh, think no, there's some that's, merit that's, to that? that? That's totally true. I mean, that, um, I almost get a kick out of it because um, honestly, some of the, the best bowls in the state are within an hour, hour and a half of Denver. Um, and I was the, the elk numbers is good. No, but I mean that, that front range and that central Rockies area has some great bulls. Um, but everybody from, you know, the, the front range, the, they look at the statistics and they see, oh, the elk numbers are great here in Northwest Colorado or, you know, the Western half of the state where our herd numbers are larger. So they drive the five hours out to come elk hunting and they drive right by some, um, some great elk hunting per se and you know i always kind of giggled at that because here i am on the western half of the state driving east to hunt elk sometimes (laughs) and um yeah it's but honestly i think i think the key to becoming a a proficient over-the-counter elk hunter is it's just time spent and guys guys get so caught up in chasing the, the the latest story or the next grass you know best thing or they're you know looking for greener grass but it's time spent i mean you just got to basically pick a unit and just hunt it and learn it because i mean you might go through i mean there's growing pains in it like if, if it was easy everybody would be you know killing every year and that's why i think our statewide success is maybe 10 percent on a given year right. you know and, and we've always had a saying that 90 percent of people kill the same 10 i mean kill 10 percent of the elk year in and year out and it's it's those of us are you know i don't know if i'm in that group or not but um it's just putting your time in and really learning a unit and you have to it's animal behavior because i mean as you elk are habitual creatures you know they they want to you know consistently go to the same places the same escape routes and and you've got to put the time in and learn that if you were giving tips to guys that are coming to archery elk hunt otc in colorado um you, you obviously talk about putting in time. You obviously talk about learning the unit. You, you I heard you say, you know, put keep your call in the pocket and, you know, maybe treat it more like a high country mule deer hunt. Is there any other specific tips you would give guys um, across the board that are hunting OTC Colorado elk? Yeah, I mean, I would. One thing is you've got to hunt it per the terrain. You know, if you've got a, if you're hunting more one of these western half of the states, kind of more high desert country, um, I would really consider perhaps coming early in the season and looking at, you know, locking down some water and, and just, if, if you are able to do that, you know, put time in on the water, um, cause early in the season and, and these areas with low water, you know, those elk are going to hit it. And if, if you're patient, you'll get an opportunity more times than not. Um, if you're hunting more of these high country units, you know, where you got water coming down every drainage, you know, then you're you know, focus more on, you know, using your glass, locating elk, and, you know, just getting tight on them. You know, if you, if you keep getting close, like, you know, something's got to give every now, once in a while. But I mean, as far as a time frame, a lot of guys, I think the biggest question they ask is when should I come? You know, cause that you got the month, the whole month of the September per se. And I mean, I don't know what, what you've seen over your, your time in September, but I always tell guys, I, I really like that. Like, second week of september if you can get in right before that muzzleloader hunt starts so let's say the you know like around the fifth or this year i think it's a little back but that fifth to that tenth time frame i've noticed is kind of the searching period for these bulls and and you can kind of maybe catch those bulls being more vulnerable and and you can work some like cold call stands where you'll see bulls you know they're looking to gather harems and they're they're coming in and investigating more so than, you know, if a guy, a lot of guys like that last week, because that's when the rut per se is heavier, but those bulls are cowed up and it's really hard to pull them away. Yeah. And some of these, um, 
uh, you know, this will be my fourth year over at the Ot Six Ranch, and you know, we're talking private land. But I, you know, the first year I was over there, I commented to all my buddies that I've never seen elk so skittish in my life, and I think it's just bred into them from an early age of getting shot at and harassed and chased. And I mean, Colorado elk, and 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 I'll say cows specifically. They are super wary and super on guard at all times. Um, and I think that's something to, you know, point out to the fact that you're saying, you know, the, a lot of guys like to come the very last week, which, yes, they might hear more bugling, but they're going to be with, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 cows. And those cows aren't dumb. And those cows' heads on a swivel. Would you uh, just curious your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I totally agree. I mean, I. I've seen it a ton. Like when these bulls, I mean, they think the bulls are calling the shots, but I mean, they're not. I mean, when that bull gets in with cows and that usually, I mean, I've seen it happen. I mean, it's year to year. I mean, I've seen bulls running around by like big mature bulls by themselves. The the September 20th, you know, it's every year is a little different, but primarily once those bulls cow up about the 15th, 18th of September is when they really kind of are cowed up heavy. Yeah. And, and I mean, that lead cow, she calls the shots and I mean, he can move cows around, but I mean, you're trying to beat 30 elk versus one. I mean, your odds are, you know, if you can get that bull before he's really harmed up and he's looking to gather cows and, you know, that's, that seems to be, in my opinion, when majority of the mature bulls get killed, whether it's a primo unit or an over the counter unit is that first two weeks of season when those bulls are alone and they're, they're looking and they're curious, but they're not. You know, they don't have a woman telling them what to do all day. And and I think, too, when they're kind of, even when they're just fresh on the cows, when they're first getting into it, it's they they have a little bit of vulnerable uh, quality to them when, because they want it and they're, they're searching and they're looking and they're, you know, they're, I call it, you know, fresh on cows. Um, I'm getting a little feedback there. Uh, you all right? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry about that, Jay. I was having to plug my phone in. Was, <laughs> no sweat. That was my bad. No yeah, sweat. But go ahead. Yeah, um, but, you know, when they're fresh on those cows, a lot of times that they're susceptible to calling. Uh, one question I've got for you is, you know, we hear all the time that the elk rut in Colorado is moving later and later and later and really not get getting going until October and more bugling, say, between the end of the archery hunt and the beginning of the first rifle season i'm curious your comments or your your experience with that and and your opinion of that is that from a pressure standpoint or do you think number one do you agree with it and if you do what's causing it and is it pressure 100 percent agree with that and i 100 percent agree it's pressure because what those elk have learned is is um you know we have that two week break from the end of archery till that first rifle hunt so i mean they've just you know They've just learned that, you know, that's when there's no one in the woods. That's when people aren't pressuring me and that's when they rut. And I mean, could be, I mean, to be quite honest with you, the last probably four years, I've killed more bulls bugling and calling them in with cow calls in the first rifle than I have in the last week of archery. That says a lot right there. And, and I just, you know, and that's, I mean, I think that's what Colorado did this year, trying to move that archery season later and later into um, September. But ultimately, I think if you're going to catch the rut at this point, you almost need to go with what Montana's doing right now and pushing that archery season clear into that last week in October. I mean, the first week of October, because really, if you were to ask me right now, what's the peak of the rut, I'd tell you October 1st. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see on the Ot 6, I definitely see the end of September. I mean, they're just, end of September and first five, six days of October, they are absolutely screaming their guts out, chasing, fighting. I mean, just just getting after it for sure. Um, yep. I, I want to ask you, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the limited draw units and put you on the spot here. And if you had to rank... From best, your top five elk units, and it, you know it could be archery, it could be or the right, but just just top five limited draw units in Colorado. What would they be? Uh, number one would probably be, man, it'd be a toss up for number one, but I'd probably say two hundred one, 
and then a close second, depending on who you ask, but it'd be probably number one would be 201, number two would be unit two, three would be unit 10, um, four, I would probably say I would give it to unit 40, and then number five, I would say unit 851. 851, huh? Yeah. Huh. And that would be the Boscadillo, so or the Hill Ranch, um, Ranch of Wildlife tags. Okay. Um, where does sixty-one or seventy-six probably fall? Six and seven there. Yeah, they'd be right in there. I mean, those are sixty-one, seventy-six, forty-nine. I mean, those are good hunts, but I mean, if I'm talking like where I have the best chance of killing a bull over three fifty, um, I would say in that order. Um, and, and out of out of those, Cole, like 201, 210, and 40, which one of them has m- the most private land issues where it's, you know, it, uh, great hunting, but it's locked up on private? Is is there a couple of those units that are actually public land is phenomenal? Uh, well, as far as private locked up, you're definitely going to have to throw 40 at the top of that. Um, 40 is... Man, I bet you that unit, I, I don't quote me because I don't know it factually, but I would bet that unit is almost 60% private land. Okay. Um, so it, it's a great place if you have the ability to go guided, get a landowner tag, or have a trespass option um, because that's phenomenal if you can get on the private ground in 40. Okay. Um, public land hunting, I mean, I would say 2 or 201 is just, it's unreal, especially if you can get your hands on that early rifle tag. Because you're you're hunting bulls October first with a rifle, and it, I mean the bull to cow ratio, especially in say unit two, I, I'm pretty comfortable saying it's a seventy thirty cow rate bull to cow ratio there. Wow, um, I've had days in unit two where I went out and seen twenty five thirty bulls in a day and barely been able to find a cow, um, and it's not uncommon there. Like a, a big mature herd bull, he might only have two to five, six cows total. Um, and like a, an enormous amount of cows out there would be 10. Really? Yeah, it's just a weird, really weird dynamic. And and you'll see that in um, unit 201 also, but there seems to be a little, um, you know, more middle of the ground, middle road bull to cow ratio i'd say it's more 50 50 and 201 but unit two it's it's a very high bull to cow ratio for sure i mean and you go out there in the peak of the rut and a cow call is a very very deadly tool you can imagine and i would say probably with that with with the large amount of bulls um you get a probably quite a bit of fighting and quite a bit of broken antlers oh yeah you get a lot of bulls broken up in there when that rut gets heavy i mean the last hunt I did out there, we actually had a really good bull sound. Um, we put him to bed that night, and he was he probably had, I would say, 58-inch main beams, just slick six-point, probably 370-type bull, and went in in the morning to kill him, uh, called him into 80 yards, and his left main beam was broken right above his G3. <laughs> so that was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, next. <laughs> yeah, well, the guy was wanting to shoot him. He's like, I can get my taxidermist to rebuild that and i'm like no man we we can we can find one but yeah it was i mean just in a matter of a night walking away from him he broke his whole main beam off halfway so unreal all right let me ask you the same question when it comes to deer like your top five quality deer best units in the state in your opinion oh man this is this is a toss-up um we're going off genetics only right now i would say number one 44 um, number two would be 66. I would say number three would be 67. I'd probably say number four, 55. And fifth, it would be a toss up, but I'd probably say 21. 21 and toss up with what? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's a really hard list to make, Jay, because Right now, there's not really a golden ticket unit. I mean, we've got genetics, but, you know, it's it's real cut and dry with elk right now. What is the best? And But, I mean, like the biggest deer in the state get killed routinely 
off units no one even thinks about or they're just under the radar trash units you'd say but definitely those gunnison basin units or um you know your 44s i mean 21 in the in the let's say the late 90s mid 2000s was phenomenal um unit 10 had its day but it definitely the deer went way down in 10 so i would say northwest colorado is kind of on a downtrend for sure but um definitely those units in the eagle county and gunnison basin are probably as far as genetically speaking the best growing up in meeker um and then moving to glenwood you know or newcastle glenwood area i mean you you kind of grew up when deer i mean when they were almost at their peak and pinnacle before the 07 you know die off yeah i mean it was stupid i I guess you could say i I gotta see the very tail end of it yeah and was it just ridiculous like going to school in november and there's bucks just yeah i mean growing up in meeker yeah i mean growing up in meeker i mean just on our little ranch i mean come november december there'd be a couple hundred head of deer on our ranch and you know a couple hundred head elk and I mean, it wasn't uncommon just to go for a drive, you know, just driving out south of town and you could, you'd see a thousand deer on the hay fields. It wasn't a big deal. And, uh, I think it would have been 2004 was the first year I was 12 years old and deer tags were dang near over the counter. I mean, they, I wouldn't, I mean, dad did my apps back then, but I I remember my first tag, I had, um, a third season buck tag in Peons Creek, which is 22 and we just weekend hunted and i think we got about eight inches of snow we drove me out there we looked at about eight different bucks and i was 12 and you know slow on the gun and i think i ended up shooting like a 190 inch buck the first day i <laughs> went deer hunting so i mean it was like you know until i was about no let's say 16 18 years old i thought killing a big like 180 inch mule deer wasn't even a big deal right I mean, like I said, I we just went and drove around on the truck on oil field roads and just, oh, there's a buck, there's a buck, there's a buck. And finally, one was dumb enough and rutted up enough to stop at 200 yards and let a 12-year-old kid shoot him, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's not giving yourself any credit. <laughs> no, but I, I can tell you I was, I mean, it was, it was like that. I mean, and it, plus there was a foot of snow on the ground it was like you got tons of deer and a foot of snow on the ground in november it was just like you know shooting fish in a barrel yeah unreal um definitely haven't seen that since for for the deer hunters out there for the guys that have deer tags and you know there's a ton of them that have those second season deer tags any tips you can offer to the guys with second season specifically you know before any rutting you know early season specific tips you'd give guys yeah i mean i think our second seasons actually might change here with the the later dates but um i've actually personally been pretty big on the second season myself just because the ability to get um tags and quality units easier um but what i found with the second is it's it's one october is a tough month to hunt deer especially big deer but you've got to treat it um like it's an archery hunt but it's not and you've got to really focus on those transition zones um because you know a lot of our units here we've go from you know we've got twelve thousand plus feet down to winter range at six thousand um so you've got to look at um uh, weather plays into it but you definitely need to look into those zones where those deer are transitioning out of out of the basins and they're starting to seek cover and it's a it's a really big patient game or patience game with second season. You've got to be willing to put a lot of time behind the glass. Don't expect to see a lot of mature deer moving in the day. You're pretty much you're focused heavily on the first thirty minutes and the last thirty minutes. Um, That's great and, advice. Yeah, and I mean it's I mean don't if you're don't hunt the does. It's it's totally the opposite idea of like a november hunt when people are saying cover the does when you find does in the second you need to get above them because wherever the does are you the bucks are they're hanging higher unless you've just had this crazy you know october snow that's kicking deer out of the high country but you know on a normal year i mean my last three bucks second season have been pushing eleven thousand feet and that was a question i was going to ask you and it's something that 
you know, I, I've always heard and don't have a ton of experience. I mean, I've hunted some second season Colorado tags, uh, but mostly third, um, is that the biggest bucks will literally stay in the high country a lot. I shouldn't say the biggest bucks, but a lot of the big mature deer will stay as high as they can, as long as they possibly can. I mean, literally up to their belly in snow if they have to. What are your thoughts on that? No, that's that's totally true. On units, they have that ability to. So like those Gunnison Basin units, you know, the central, let's say the central Rockies area. So that'd be, you know, let's say Grand County, um, Pitkin, Garfield, Gunnison, like those areas where they have that high country available to them. Um, they, they definitely will. And that's definitely where I go looking for them. Like when I, on those second season hunts, I start high, like I'm glassing above tree line to start. And if I'm not finding them there, then I'm just working down, working down, working down. Um, but definitely I'm catching my, my bucks. I've been killing them in that, like right below tree line when they start getting into that scattered timber pocket country, you know, and I mean, it's, it's tough hunting in that time of year when you're that high and, um, but yeah, the definitely those bucks will do that and bulls too. But don't you think, I mean, it's a mindset you're going in, you're looking for one big deer and you've got the whole season, that whole second season to do it. And you're looking for a big deer. I think a lot of people go into it and they're like, well, you know, I got it as a second season tag. I didn't waste any points. You know, I got it as a second choice and, you know, I'll just go shoot a buck. I would be the opposite. I'd be like, I'm fortunate to get to draw this tag and I'm going to go and look for a giant or nothing. Um, don't you agree that, I mean, I guess it depends on how many deer you've killed and what have you, but I mean, it's all about a mindset of, you know taking the approach that i want i'm looking for one buck yeah i mean that's that's exactly how i hunt it i mean as a resident I'm, and even if you're a non-resident you can find these tags they're not and i look at it as you know it's 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 low risk high reward right is how i would i would um put it you know if i go up there for nine days and hunt my butt off and i don't find that deer then you know i didn't burn any points i didn't you know i didn't have a lot of chips on the table and I can come right back and, you know, use what I learned that year on the next year. And um, honestly, it's an approach a lot more people need to take. And, you know, if they want to start hunting Colorado and doing it well is don't sit and build points for 15 years and gamble it on one hunt. Try to go on as many hunts as you can, because some years it's going to be tough and some years it's going to be good and you just can't predict it. Right. And like um, you said earlier too, I mean, some of the biggest bucks in Colorado get randomly shot in just random places, random units. And it just goes to show, I mean, that's one thing about Colorado, even if you say, you know, it's kind of on a decline and not what it was. I mean, there's still some big deer around and it seems like if you really work hard at it and, you know, have the, the patience and the willingness to, you know, sit and look and look and look and not see much. And all of a sudden you're looking for one buck. I mean, I would venture to say, Cole, I could probably pick you and throw you in any unit uh, and, and there, you're going to have a pretty good chance to come out with a pretty dang good buck when it comes to all the bucks shot in that unit. I would venture to say a guy like yourself would come out with a pretty good buck. I mean, hopefully, but I mean, it, it definitely, I mean, it, I think definitely mule deer hunting is a total mindset and it's it's almost like having the mental toughness to just go every day and right. just grind you know, it. it. It's a, it's definitely a, you got to be hard nosed to do it Yeah. this way. I want to, um, I want to finish by asking you, uh, the Colorado bear explosion. Um, and you got a little taste of that shot at just an absolute giant bear. I don't know if it was last year or a couple of years ago shot just a, I mean, you showed me a picture. It was just a slob of a bear. Um, tell us about the Colorado bear explosion. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's out of control, especially <laughs> in the, you know, in my neck of the woods. I mean, there's, I mean, I've never seen so many bears. It's not uncommon to, you know, in these Mesa County, Garfield County units right now, or even down into Montrose County, just to go out. And it, it's not uncommon to see five, six bears a day, um, and big bears too. And, um, that the bear you were bringing up, I, I've never really had an interest in bears. It was just kind of in 2018. I was like, 
you know, I was like, dang it. Like, I, I, mean, I better, you know, practice what I preach and at least go kill one, you know. Because I've been, you know, there's, these bears are damn hard on our, our mule deer fawns and our elk calves. And and um, so anyways, I, I picked up a tag in 18. And I hunted one day, seen seven bears. And I, I shot a seven foot three um, color face bear that scores 21 and three eights. So <laughs> probably one of the top, I think he's like top 15 all time in the state of Colorado. But my, my taxidermist had to mount him on a, a grizzly form. Wow. Because he was, he was too big for a black bear for him. Cause I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. I, I show up to get him checked the division wildlife here and, and their little gal up front, she's like, Oh, and I just tell her, I mean, guy got a bear and she goes, okay, well there's another gentleman out here with the bear. So, you know, go over and get your bear out next to him. And he's got a pretty good bear. I'd say, you know, probably six, five, you know, probably 300 some pounder. And I get over there and I have this thing rolled up in a rubber made and, <laughs> I pull it out and I mean, I'm not a big guy by any means and I can't get sucker off. You know, I can't lift it. And this other game warden comes over and they lift it and we roll it out on the ground and it made that six, six bear look little and all these game wardens are, you know, huddling up, taking pictures of it with their cell phone. And, and they're like asking me what I'm going to do with it. And I'm like, Oh, maybe get a rug or something. And, you know, I'm like, well, is he going to make Boone and Crockett? They're like, Oh, he'll make Boone and Crockett and then some. Wow. So, yeah, that was about, you know, beginner's luck on bear hunting for me. So. <laughs> you know, I've been seeing them the last couple of years. I mean, I just saw one the other day coming back. I was floating the roaring fork and, and uh, actually going to get your trailer that you loaned me because I broke the axle on mine. And here's a, and I've seen several, right? I mean, f- floating down the river, like look in front of us, there's a bear crossing the river. The last two years, I've probably seen more bears in the river than I've seen in the last 15 here in colorado um oh yeah like Hell, heck you everywhere. can go yeah you can go up to aspen and shake hands with one any day you want they're, yeah. they're running there were there was one in my on my job site yesterday we uh um last it was kind of late f- uh f- i'd say late august kind of we were just uh walking to dinner uh there in aspen and we hit three or four different little roads and we're bouncing around going back to the vehicle and there was bear scat everywhere i mean every sidewalk was covered in it i'm just like before the sun goes down we better get out of here because it gets crazy here after the sun goes down with bears and it does you should see the i mean you know you work up there it's it's pretty awesome you'll you'll laugh at this one jay the other day we were so we were were doing this big house in um snow mass right now and they they have a, they're doing a pool, right? So it's got like a kind of a, a pool house. Like it's all the mechanicals going down in this like crawl space off the pool house. Mm-hmm. And uh, I show up to the job site about six or in the morning and they're one of the laborers, this Mexican guy, he can barely speak English and he's telling me, grande oso, grande oso. <laughs> I'm saying, like, where, key? And he, he's pointing over at the pool house and I'm going, what the hell? And I, <laughs> I walk over there and I, you know, it's just dusky dark and I have a headlamp on top of my hard hat. And I turn it on, and that sucker is down in the crawl space where I was going to work that day. And so I'm sitting there like, well, get, dang it. And I, I, grabbed, I was grabbing dirt clods and throwing it down in there. And finally that sucker comes comes out of there and takes off. And he was about a 400-pound bear. And, I mean, he just made a mess of that crawl space area. I mean, just crapped piled, all over. Yeah, you know, bear crap. Oh, he yeah. he had ripped open material, the, the – um, there was some insulation for all the, you know, mechanical equipment. He'd got into that. You know, he was trying to make a nest. It looked pretty comfy down there. But, uh-huh. but, wow, that's yeah, a he, good story. It, yeah, you know, <laughs> they're, they're out of control. So anybody that's coming to Colorado hunting that archery or October, you know, into first rifle time frame, definitely take advantage of those tags because they're dev- they're, they're very liberal about giving them out, and they are cheap, even to a non-resident. And I mean, they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, yeah. especially if you're elk hunting and you get done, you know, you come out and smack one the first day or two. Like, I mean, once a, I mean, you can get it. I think non-resident bear tags are sub a hundred bucks right now. Like you, you might as well. I mean, that's crazy um, yeah. for non-residents to think that you could, you know, come out and get a bear tag for under a hundred bucks. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Oh yeah. I mean, I tell my clients, they come every year. I'm like, get a dang bear tag because you know, it's not uncommon for these guys to come out on a seven day hunt and we whack a bull the first day and it's like, well, you got a week vacation. You want me to ride, ride you out of here so you can go back to Houston or do you want to stay and shoot a bear? 
you know, and we've killed a lot of dang bears just going back and sitting on the gut pile. Like it, yeah. I mean, even in Gunnison, they're, they're crawling everywhere. So, I mean, it's definitely not a bad idea. I mean, Cole, I know you guys have some great tags in your family coming up, and I'm excited to see um, you're just going to be running all over the place here once uh, the season start. And uh, I want to encourage the listeners to uh, follow Cole on Instagram. It's Cole, it's C-O-L-E underscore U-L-L-O-M. And I'm going to link that up in the show notes as well as Cole's business, Tenderfoot Outfitters, and the link to Tenderfoot dot out or us. Uh, uh, dash outfitters.com uh it was great fishing with the other the other night and it's uh great getting to know you and i appreciate you coming on and spending some time with uh with me and uh shedding some light on colorado and again i look forward to seeing you've got some great great tags uh elk uh coming up here in in colorado so uh it's going to be a great season for you i know it and uh I'll be uh, chatting at you, but uh, thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Yeah, of course, Jay. Awesome, buddy. God bless. All right, take care. You too, man. All right.